Hello, this is Dr. Grant Cooper at Princeton Spine and Joint Center. In this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about knee pain in under 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Are you ready? We have a lot to cover in a short time and we aren't going to cut any corners, so let's get started. Understanding most cases of non-traumatic knee pain in adults is actually pretty simple. That's not to say that treating it is always easy but it does mean that usually it's not too complicated to figure out what's causing the knee pain and the options to treat it. And the good news is that there are usually great options. Let's start with the causes. In younger adults, there are two most common causes of knee pain, meniscus injuries and patellofemoral syndrome. The menisci are the shock absorbers of the knee. You have one on the inside of the knee, the medial meniscus, and you have one on the outside of the knee, the lateral meniscus. Pain from a meniscus happens one of two ways. It can be from a sudden event. For example, you're, you're tackled from the side and the knee buckles inward or you twist your knee and there's a sudden pain. Basically, there's an acute injury and the cause is obvious. There was no pain, you had an injury, and now there's pain. And the pain in this instance is typically sharp and intense. The other type of meniscus injury is more gradual. In this instance, slowly the knee starts to hurt and when asked, you can't really remember a clear injury. Perhaps there were a series of smaller injuries or maybe just an awareness that the knee has been hurting more and more uh, gradually over time. Meniscus pain is usually present on the side of the knee, the inside or the outside, depending on which meniscus inv is involved, with the medial meniscus on the inside of the knee uh, being more common to be, to be painful than the, the lateral meniscus. But it's important to keep in mind that pain from the meniscus can present in any part of the knee. When a meniscus is torn, sometimes the knee will lock or catch. Having had this happen to my own knee on many occasions, I can tell you how painful and unsettling it is for your knee to lock and catch. If you aren't sure if your knee is locking or catching, then it is not. Because when a knee locks and catches, it is really unmistakable. Sometimes I'll ask patients if, you're, if their knee locks and they say, I'm not sure, in which case the answer is really no. If the knee locks and then will not unlock, this can be a surgical emergency. But if it's just locking and catching and you can slowly extend your knee and unlock it, then it's just part of the injury that you need to address, whether that be surgical or non-surgical. We'll come back to that in just a few moments. The other common cause of non-traumatic knee pain in young adults is patellofemoral pain syndrome. This is a problem with the way the patella of the knee tracks in the patellar groove as you move. The patella, and here's a knee, the patella, also called the kneecap, is supposed to glide within a groove. It's kind of like this, and it glides up and down. If the muscles are tight or imbalanced, then that patella can, gr can grind on the sides of the grooves and can be very painful. Patellofemoral pain syndrome is uh, most commonly felt in the front of the knee around the patella itself. And the most common cause of knee pain in older adults is knee osteoarthritis. In knee osteoarthritis, the underlying problem is that you're losing the cartilage in the joint. Cartilage is like a sponge, and the sponge holds in the joint fluid, and then as you bend your knee, it squeezes the sponge, and the fluid is released and bathes the knee. Now, as you lose the cartilage, you lose the ability to hold on to that lubricating fluid, and you get more grinding in the knee. And then you get cascading compensatory effects, where you can get bone, spur bone spurs and other changes downstream. But the underlying problem in knee osteoarthritis is a degradation of the cartilage and therefore also a loss of the lubricating joint fluid. The second most common cause in older adults is a degenerative meniscus tear. And the third most common is patellofemoral pain syndrome. Now, how do we go about diagnosing a patient's cause of knee pain? Well, as with any medical problem, this is going to start with a complete medical history. The age of the patient, of course, is a big clue right off the bat. In older folks, you have to think about knee osteoarthritis first. In younger people, if the pain's on the side of the knee, you think meniscus, medial on the inside, lateral uh, on the outside. If the pain is in the front of the knee, you think patellofemoral pain syndrome. In older people, if the pain is pinpoint in the side of the knee, then you start to think of a degenerative meniscus tear. And if it's in the front of the knee, again, you would be thinking of patellofemoral pain syndrome. The physical examination can be helpful as well. Tenderness over the joint line suggests meniscus pain. Tenderness along the patella 
suggests patellofemoral pain syndrome. Of note, if the patella tendon itself is very tender, but nothing else is, then it's likely that it's actually something called patellar tendinitis. This is a more common diagnosis in people who play sports with lots of jumping, but it's still relatively uncommon in the grand scheme of knee pain. X-rays of the knee will show, will show you the bones and the joint space, and they can rule out fractures, and they can give you a sense of the degree of arthritis in the knee. An MRI is by far the best diagnostic study for evaluating knee pain. It will show you the soft tissue as well as the bony structures in the knee. But even an MRI has very serious limitations. The main limitation for a knee MRI when used to help diagnose knee pain is that there's so much background noise. Consider this, by the time you're 60, just about everyone has some amount of arthritis in their joint. And at any adult age, it's not uncommon to see a meniscus tear even in the absence of any symptoms. So while you may see a lot of pathology on a knee MRI, the MRI can't tell you which pathology is actually causing the pain. Now that said, MRIs do show the anatomy very well and they are great for judging the integrity of ligaments in the knee. For example, if you're concerned about a torn ACL. In an acute injury in a young person, they can look for any ligament tears and also judge the extent of any meniscus damage, for example. However, in a 40-year-old with knee pain, who's had, let's say, the knee pain for three months, who goes and gets an MRI, the presence of a, of a meniscus tear is consistent with the meniscus being the cause of pain, but it's not diagnostic for the simple reason that the meniscus tear might have been present for a year or more, and the pain may be coming from patellofemoral pain syndrome or something else. If I had a patient with pain around the kneecap that was worse with climbing and descending stairs, and who didn't have any locking or catching in the knee. And if that patient had been sent for an MRI that showed a medial meniscus tear, I would still be thinking that the pain in that patient was more likely coming from the patello, from patellofemoral pain syndrome than from the meniscus tear, because the pain is so much more clinically consistent with that diagnosis. It's also important to note that MRIs will miss some small meniscus tears. Even an MR arthrogram, which is uh, similar test, but in here in an MR arthrogram, you're putting dye into the joint and then you take the MRI, you can still miss some small meniscus tears. This is all to say then that it's important to remember that an MRI is an important part, but only a part of a diagnosis. As always in medicine, we must remember to treat the person and not just the imaging study. You might be wondering why some people can have meniscus tears and have pain, while others have the same tears in their knee and have no pain. And it's a great question. The reason why some people can have arthritis or a meniscus tear and have symptoms, while others have the same degenerative changes but have no symptoms, is a function of if the body responds to those degenerative changes with inflammation. Right? And it's, it's that inflammatory reaction, that inflammatory reaction to the arthritis or to the meniscal tears or to the patella grinding, uh, that's either going to cause pain or isn't. Now, inflammation is a protein response, but the best way to think about it is that it's like a fire. And there are two ways you can put out a fire. One way is to clear away all the fodder. You clear away the fodder and the fire dies down. Non-surgically, moving away the fodder from the fire is done primarily by learning and doing exercises to stretch and strengthen the muscles around the joint in order to take the pressure off of that joint so that the joint can rest and ultimately heal. The exercises also become very important to help prevent future injury to the joints. Now, the other way you can put out a fire is with a fire hose. In this instance, the fire hose is anti-inflammatory medication, either oral or, more effectively, via injection. But let's return to that in just a moment as we review each condition. For all of the knee pathologies we've mentioned, exercises can be extremely effective. Unloading this weight-bearing joint with the right exercises is sometimes all you need to do in order to fix the joint. To go through the exercises, you can check out our knee exercise videos for the best exercises that you can be doing at home. Now for each of these problems, when exercises don't help enough to alleviate the pain, or if the pain is limiting your ability to perform the exercises correctly, there are other medical steps that can be taken. Let's review them here. Knee osteoarthritis is a problem of a lack of cartilage, as we said. Now, medical science hasn't gotten to a place where we can replace the cartilage, not yet, but we can replace the joint fluid. 
And remember, it's the joint fluid that we really need in order to lubricate and nourish the joint. We can do this with an injection series called visco supplementation. And there are many products that are on the market, such as you may have heard of Synvisc or Uflexa or Orthovisc or Hyalgan and many others. Basically, this is a series of between one, three, and five injections, depending on the brand that's used. And these injections should always be performed under ultrasound guidance to make sure that the needle is correctly placed in the knee joint. Now, these injections replace the joint fluid, but like we just said, the cartilage is not being replaced. So without replacing the cartilage, without the sponge to hold the joint fluid in, the fluid slowly reabsorbed by the body and the injections of visco supplementation may need to be repeated in about six months. Steroid injections can also be very effective for, effective for treating the inflammation from knee osteoarthritis, but generally these injections only last for about three months. One arguably underutilized injection approach is with Ketorolac, or Toradol, which is like a liquid Advil. This is a strong anti-inflammatory that doesn't last as long as steroids, but it also doesn't have any del deleterious effects on the knee as steroids can if repeated. There's also regenerative medicine techniques, uh, different regenerative injections such as PRP, prolotherapy, amniotic fluid injections, and others. These approaches have all been used uh, for all sorts of knee conditions discussed with varying levels of success. These approaches are unfortunately not covered by insurance for the main reason that they just haven't been reproducibly proven to work in controlled trials. That doesn't mean that people don't find benefit from them. To be sure, for almost every regenerative medicine technique, you'll find diehard fans in both doctors and patients alike. And just ask Joe Rogan or many other athletes about their experiences with Regenekine and other forms of PRP or platelet-rich plasma and prolotherapy, and you'll hear amazing success stories. But keep in mind that when it doesn't work for other people, you are less likely to hear about those. In the end, regenerative medicine techniques are definite options for people with knee pain, and particularly those who aren't getting better with conservative approaches and who want to avoid surgery. And finally, there are surgical approaches that are getting more and more refined. Arthroscopic surgery is a minimally invasive surgery that's used to clean out the arthritis, uh, and this has the large benefit of having minimal recovery time. But it's not going to work depending on how much arthritis is present in the knee. For that, there are partial and full knee replacements that involve a lot less downtime than they used to. For a degenerative meniscus tear, the treatment options are ostensibly the same as we just discussed. One helpful way to think of a degenerative tear in the meniscus is that it's like a pothole in the road. And visco supplementation in particular helps to pave the pothole, right? It kind of fills it in with the fluid. Patellofemoral pain syndrome, by contrast to the others, is a condition that responds absolutely best to exercises as opposed to other forms of therapy, such as injections or surgery. There are very specific exercises for patellofemoral pain syndrome that tend to work really well. That said, when more is needed, visco supplementation is one good option. Steroid injections can be used, but they're much less helpful for, for patellofemoral pain syndrome than for other knee conditions. Surgical approaches for patellofemoral pain syndrome are really discouraged, but they could include things like iliotibial band release if it's pulling the patella to the side too much because of chronic tightness that's otherwise just unresolvable. But this is a controversial subject to say the least. Generally, patellofemoral alignment issues do best with exercises and occasionally injections to help the person participate better with those exercises. Finally, in the case of an acute meniscus tear, this often improves spontaneously by itself with a little bit of time. Relative rest and exercises, exercises often are very effective. When needed, the same injection approaches as we previously discussed can all be considered, and surgery is sometimes needed, particularly with locking that doesn't easily resolve, but also with recalcitrant debilitating symptoms in patients with large tears who aren't getting better with conservative therapy. That's it. I, I did go over our 10 minute uh, time limit for this knee pain tutorial. Um, I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it worthwhile to go over the time limit. If you have enjoyed it and if you've learned something, uh, then please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and tell a friend who might enjoy it because that's the way that we can spread good health information and achieve good health outcomes together. As always, if you have questions that you'd like for me to answer in a future video 
Or if you have any comments, you can reach me at drcooper at princetonsjc.com. Or of course, leave a comment in the comment section. Thank you very much.